можно как она здесь сидел, наверное, добавил, да? Да, 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 но это нормально, да. Бахал да зато и бенеда техническая зелька и зато и все. Не кепки нуку и вкусные. Нормально, да. Мы отшкали делим SD за шли, а S, то есть он SD карти с шуткими. Очень добро шал везде. Добрый день! Кто был на парти? Make sure to be there in time. That is really the, the basic rule there. We will also have an extra slot of lightning talks today. And it will be between noon and one o'clock. So it's during lunch break. So make sure to grab a really fast lunch at noon. And probably we'll start the lightning talks like at 12.15 here in this room. Okay. So, one other thing, here in this room, really no foods, no drinks. The university really wants to keep this place like it is. It's a really nice place and we have to respect that. So then, it's my, we really are really glad to have Dan Guido of Trail Bits to have their first talk on the second day. And then the floor is yours. Thanks. Yeah. So good morning, everybody. I'm probably in about the same boat as most of you. I'm not hungover, but my body does think it's 2 a.m. in the morning, or that I, I did wake up at 2 a.m. this morning. So uh, we'll both be a little bit delirious during the entire talk. <laughs> so I'll be talking today about EIP Revisited, and that'll make more sense as I go on. But what I'm intending to do is showcase a little bit about where I think the industry's come from, where we're at now, and what I'd like to see us do in the future uh, in order to stop where we're going. Um, and I'll be using lots of statistics to back up uh, all of the different things that I'm talking about. So a typical keynote might be a little bit more abstracted. My style is a bit more hard data. Uh, so we'll, we'll get into it. A little bit about me. Uh, I work at a company called Trail of Bits. I co-founded it last year with two buddies of mine, uh, Dino Daisovi and Alexander Sotorov. And we had a fourth partner join us shortly after we launched, uh, Vincenzo Iozzo, if you know him. Uh, we kind of pride ourselves as really knowing what's going on in exploitation a little bit more than the average person. We've written a couple books about it, the Mac Hacker's Handbook, the iOS Hacker's Handbook. We've won a couple of Pwn to Own contests. Um, I think four, maybe five. Uh, so we try to use that knowledge to help people understand what do you really need to do to stop a determined attacker from breaking into your company? Uh, you can count on us to know because we've actually been on the other side of the fence and succeeded a number of times. I'm also a hacker in residence at NYU Poly. I help kids understand the kinds of things that attackers are doing right now. And I teach a class there called Vulnerability Analysis and Penetration Testing. Actually, it's the other way around. Penetration Testing and Vulnerability Analysis. Uh, every semester I have about 15 kids and we teach them how to write Windows 7 exploits and then how to perform phishing testing. Uh, I also mentor some research there, uh, so if students actually do want to do security research at the university, I help them guide them through uh, the areas of research they want to explore. And then the way that Wim probably knows me best is from my Twitter personality, Why Isn't Dan Fat, uh, which you can see the picture for up there, it's me with a turkey leg, uh, where I post all kinds of ridiculous food adventures that I go on. But during the course of this talk, my actual Twitter account is dguido. If anybody would like to you know, yell at me or disagree with me or uh, repeat any of the statistics that I am talking about, you're free to. Uh, shout me out, I will happily respond after the talk is over. So, 
The way that most people came to know who I was was a talk I gave a number of years ago called the Exploit Intelligence Project. Uh, it was basically a case study that I did to prove how intelligence-driven security could be applied to a real security problem you had and come up with uh, a real effective strategy going forward. So we kind of asked the questions, how do we use intelligence to mitigate a threat? What are the optimal defenses given a particular threat, in this case, mass malware? Um, we focused in on crime packs in particular. What's the ecosystem around those crime packs? How do they acquire exploits? What are they capable of doing? And then is there security research, the kind that's being talked about today, or at Black Hat, or any of these other conferences, how is that being applied by these individual kid owners uh, and being used to compromise millions of people a year? Really what I was trying to do was to separate what could happen from what is happening. A lot, far too often in security we talk about all these possibilities, but we don't actually focus on the things on the ground, what we need to do to stop what's going on today. So by separating the two of those, we can see what we need to do rather than uh, the kind of FUD uh, fear, uncertainty, doubt that um, a lot of other kind of vendors put in people's heads throughout the industry. So some of the things we found were that they were clear market leaders. We found that there were basically four or five kits that we could look at to gain a big picture view of everything going on. We found that they had very limited target support. Among those kits that were popular, they basically attacked four main programs. We found that they had extremely low quality exploits. They were not using any of the exploitation techniques during the day. Uh, so, very basic exploit mitigation would break all of, their, uh, all of their bundled exploits. And as well, they were attacking components that I didn't really care about. They were attacking things like Java, which I can easily disable in the internet zone. Who actually uses a legitimate applet these days, in 2013, or even in 2010? No one, right? Uh, so these very simple configuration switches could have saved you from a lot of pain back in 2009, 2010. We found that all the exploits they used were developed elsewhere. They weren't developing anything on their own. They were stealing them from, in the case of any kind of memory corruption exploit, they took them from APT campaigns. In the case of any kind of logic flaw, they took them from white hat security researchers. Uh, this was a really interesting result, and there's a lot of different ways that you can read into this particular data. Uh, we can see that there's a declining number of security researchers that care about memory corruption. That number seems to be going down. However, APT seems to have no capability to understand logic flaws. They don't gain a good architectural understanding of the software they exploit. They fuzz it to find crashes and write very formulaic exploits for those. So this was an interesting result. And then we, predi we predicted that Java was a path forward. We, these guys, they look at the least cost path in order to achieve the goal they want. They start at malicious HTML, they need a shell. Am I gonna solve the hard problem or the easy one? So Java provides us a really easy way out to not have to attack any of these difficult mitigations. So we're going to go the bottom path. We're going to take Java. So this is back in 2010 when I was talking about this. And you know, I, if anybody's been paying attention and wants to predict kind of some of the things I'll say later in the talk, this has definitely come true. And then based on that, we derived optimal defenses. Because we know exactly what's being attacked and what capabilities they have to write exploits, we know there's very limited, uh, a very limited number of things that they can do. So these very simple defenses, basically three, were enough to really save you from all the pain that was going on at the time. You could enable depth, which wasn't really enabled by default in, in, a, in a 2009 time frame. You could remove Java from the internet zone, leave it on your computer, but as long as you can access it through the browser. You could flip one configuration flag in Adobe Reader. And then when EMET came out in late 2009, early 2010, you could use it when possible, when necessary, but it wasn't absolutely going to, uh, you know, uh, you didn't absolutely need to use it all the time. So the final thing there was you needed to continue to monitor your threat intelligence to make sure that this held true, and when it did change, you needed to update your strategy. So now let's talk about where they are now. <coughs> So crime packs in 2013, a lot's changed since 2009. Uh, we can see the different software versions that are available on a standard desktop, standard corporate desktop these days, really takes advantage of the software, uh, the exploit mitigations that uh, came into play back in that time frame. So you see most of these things are using depth, most of these things are using ASLR, most of these things are using actual real sandboxes like 
with restricted tokens and low integrity. Um, this is a significant challenge, and that puts a lot of pressure on these different crime packs to be able to continue to do their job. So on the other end of the spectrum, we have the most popular ones today. We have exploit kits like Black Hole and Pool and Sweet Orange and Ganda. Have these kits invested any resources whatsoever to bypass these mitigations today? Four years, three years later. How have they been dealing with pressure? How are DEP and ASLR holding up, essentially? This is even avoiding the fact that we're not going to talk about Chrome, we're not going to talk about plugin blocking, because that puts an even more restrictive pressure on these guys to innovate or, or really fail. So to kind of illustrate this, these are some of the rates of IE, uh, Internet Explorer deployments, uh, over the last two years. You can see that gray one on the top that seems to go down to about 10% now, that's IE8. That's the last version that's working on Windows XP, um, and, and it, it's really declining in, in, uh, in, in usage. Whereas um, other versions, like, let's see, 10 actually got a really big jump there. So these versions that do have these capabilities, like dev turned on by default, ASLR compiled in by default, that use restricted tokens, that use low integrity, there's a lot more of them today than there were a couple of years ago. And this is a challenge for people that want to conduct massive exploitation. So the number of ownable systems is getting smaller. So when we take a look at those exploit kits and bundle them together, the first thing that pops out is that they basically have two modes of operation. They have Java for everything that's not XP, and they have IE and Reader and Flash for everything that is XP. They haven't implemented the capability to exploit any types of memory corruption flaws that work on platforms higher than XP. So they're still not bypassing SLR. This is the profile of a system that these crime packs can now exploit. And this is it. After XP, it's all Java, or you, or you get magic weapons dropped from the sky, which is that little tiny sliver here that we'll talk about. So that one in the bottom, that can exploit most systems on the internet if you're not patched. It's the true type font bug that was in Dooku that was repurposed for a lot of these massive exploitation campaigns. And I call this one close encounters of the EIP kind. Uh, this is a real operation in the data. The only way that these crime packs seem to be able to get really good exploitation capabilities is if they're handed them on a silver platter by some incredibly complicated and sophisticated APT group. Uh, so that's kind of where they are today. Um, it's, it's a little bit surprising. I thought they may, may have gotten further. If we look at where the other ones came from, so that one came from Dooku, right? But all of the other ones uh, seem to have come from three primary sources, that's it. Uh, for all the memory corruption flaws, we've got it split about evenly in half. They're from APT campaigns, or they're from the Vupen blog. Uh, surprising, it really sent it down to these two separate sources of information. On the other hand, the Java exploits were from everywhere. Uh, it took a beating over the last two years as people realized, hey, this is the last avenue that I have to break into a, a, a current deployed Windows 7 system on the internet is Java. That's the easiest way. So it really was a, a dog pile from White Hat security researchers to break that sandbox as many times as they possibly could. So you see exploits get used from people like uh, Juran, I can't pronounce that name, from Telus Security Labs and Adam Gaudiak. Uh, the security explorations guy that dropped about 50 different sandbox escapes on Oracle in one year, uh, Stefan Cornelius, and a bunch of ZDI reporters. Um, in particular, the one guy that tops out all these, there's, I don't know why, but there's somebody that's implementing C Sharp posted in the JVM, and he just seems to find bugs in the JVM like nobody else's business. And that guy, uh, every time he finds one, writes up public exploit code, puts it on his blog, and it gets immediately shoved into some crime pack somewhere. It's great. The other way to look at this data is, so I mentioned all these memory corruption exploits came from APT campaigns and Bluepen blog. Why, where, where are the security researchers here? Last time when we looked at this back in 2010, there were at least two, but now there's zero. I call this effect uh, white hat shrugged. Uh, most of the people that are doing research in the industry nowadays are not doing it on memory corruption flaws. The last real good exploitation research I've seen um, has got to be back in like a 2009, 2010 time frame, maybe last time Mark Dowd spoke. 
Uh, and I, I just don't see that kind of stuff going on anymore. People aren't dropping exploit code for these difficult, complicated vulnerabilities anymore in conferences, uh, which in respect to this problem is actually a great thing uh, because they're no longer getting incorporated into these kits. So, great. We do have one interesting result. So there was this developer, his name is Ponch. Uh, Ponch is Russian, and he develops the Black Hole Exploit Kit, and he has a premium version called the Cool Exploit Kit. Uh, it's hosted online, you can't get a copy of the source code. As, as hard as I tried, there's no avenue for me to get it. Somebody has some, let me know, I can take a look at it. Uh, he actually launched a 100,000 US dollar bug bounty to pay people for improved exploits. Exploits that bypass depth, exploits that bypass ASLR. Ponch gets it. He understands the pressure that this entire industry that he's in is under and wants to get out of it, but he doesn't have the capabilities himself, so he tried to enlist the capabilities of others. And as a result, Pool actually does have some, uh, some unique capabilities. Um, they have the Dooku font bug, which is what he showed up to the plate with, and then it seems like they had two other exploits that were either uh, later developed by Ponch himself or contributed to him, um, likely contributed to him, since these are wide, widely different uh, capabilities. It takes a lot of different types of skills to write a Windows kernel exploit in the true type font language versus the types of skills to write a JavaScript exploit for i9 or uh, one of these Swift uh, reader bugs. So, these things, they exploit platforms that have sandboxes, that have low integrity, that use restricted tokens. IE9, uh, IE9 or Reader 10 in particular, but the cool exploit kit by itself doesn't bundle any privilege escalation to break out of it. Um, I haven't seen any in the wild, I haven't seen any uh, secondary payloads in the wild use any capabilities to escalate privileges like that. However, when we did get access to the Kaburp source code, if any of you looked through it, there's some gems in there. Um, there actually is a couple of kernel exploits. There are a couple of kernel expo exploits in that source tree if you want to go digging. Um, so while it's not there now, it could be there later. So the cool exploit kit, based on this guy's uh, perception and his, his good perception of where things are going and the pressure that he's under, they've actually made a couple of advances, which uh, you know I, I give the guy credit for. So how did we stack up? The recommendations that I gave two and a half years ago, three years ago. If you followed them, you were basically safe from all the exploits included in all those kits except for that one TTF bug. Because it bypasses every protection, goes straight to kernel code execution, and uh, it works on a wide variety of platforms. It's really, again, it's that monolith from the sky in 2001 teaching cavemen how to use tools. It's basically the situation we're dealing with. And if we look at the systems that are being deployed today, I think I would hope that most companies deploying new Windows systems today are doing it with some kind of secure Java configuration, either not letting it hit the internet or not with Java at all. And those systems right now are completely out of reach of all the crime packs that, that, I've, seen, uh, that, I, that I've seen. And this is actually interesting because this is success. In an industry that really prides itself on not solving many problems for our clients, uh, this is one that we can actually take credit for doing well at. Uh, the, the widespread adoption of things like DEV and ASLR have had a significant impact on the ability for these massive exploitation campaigns to take effect. However, on the other end, it's a warning because we know exactly what the profile of system is that is going to be compromised by these kinds of attacks. So if you have it, watch out because you will get compromised. So, yeah, congratulations. We pushed. They moved. This war is pretty much over. This all begs the question, can we follow the same procedures to work against APT? Uh, how effective are exploit mitigations and adoption of them going to, going to be against this particular threat, not one that's so simple and so amateur as crime facts? <clears throat> I love the Aurora group. I wouldn't say maybe that's gone a little too far. I really like the Aurora group. <laughs> uh, I followed their behavior, their capabilities for a long, long period of time. Trail of Bits has kind of been on their tail for quite a period of time. Uh, when they hacked Google, they used 
some exploit code for IE6 that we beat up on and we turned into a corporate training. If any of you are familiar with the Assured Exploitation course that our company offers, it's based around recovered exploit code that we got from an Aurora campaign. They're one of the most significantly sophisticated uh, APT groups that exist in China. They're a prolific developer of zero-day exploits. They have probably the largest number of disclosed zero-day capabilities out of any other group operating right now. Um, and the original source of most of those exploits we profiled for the crime packs actually came from these guys. They've also pioneered this new method of compromising uh, companies called watering holes. I call them strategic website compromises, but that's not as, uh, doesn't flow off the tongue as well. So we're just going to go with watering hole. That's where instead of spear phishing somebody, we just think about what are the websites that my intended victim goes to? I'll just hack that website, put my code up there, and wait for them to show up. So I'll go fishing in the huge stream of website visitors that that website has. And that's great. You get a lot more, a lot more shells that way. And they're really notable for being the go-to guys for the hard targets. Uh, they're the guys that got Google. They're the guys that got Big Nine. Aurora is really, from the industry's perspective, a force to be reckoned with. So I said that we profiled them for shared exploitation. Another thing we did is we looked at, uh, so Aurora has a lot of options. Um, you can kind of think of them like sort of the at stake of, of Chinese APT. Uh, they, they tend to spread out their influence among a large, loosely connected group of, of other companies, of other APT groups. Uh, so the Aurora group has really spawned a lot of other groups that have similar capabilities. And one of those is the Elderwood group. Another one might be the, if you paid attention to the news last week or the week before, Hidden Links, uh, which is what Symantec called another group that had capabilities similar to this. They're all related. Uh, these guys are most of the same people. So what I did is I looked at this Elderwood exploit kit, which you can think of as a startup for an APT group. It's an investment. They did some internal research and development to figure out how they could scale their operations even wider. So what they did is they, just, uh, they, they developed several reusable vulnerability discovery and exploitation tools, and then they gave them to a bunch of less skilled people to use to perform regular watering hole campaigns. They did this a number of times, about every three months for a period of two years. And during that time period, they came up with nine zero days, five for uh, Adobe Flash and four for Internet Explorer. And they compromised dozens of websites in each of those campaigns. The most notable was the last one that they were, uh, that, they, that I basically give them credit for, is uh, the Council on Foreign Relations, which is a very prominent uh, defense-related think tank in the United States. Um, very, very prominent uh, U.S. politicians and military thinkers are members of the Council on Foreign Relations, and their website, uh, specifically sections of their website dealing with cybersecurity, had Internet uh, Explorer zero days on them for about a month. Uh, you know, <laughs> great work, guys. That's, that's actually pretty impressive. Um, so this Elderwood group, these guys are they're dealing with the best tools that the Aurora group has to offer, and they're launching all these zero-day campaigns. It really shouldn't be possible to defend against these guys with simple things like death and ASLR. But I took a closer look at the exploits that we're dealing with, and when we really think about a quality exploit, we think about it affecting all the systems that it possibly can. Right? We have the, the, the set of all computers. Well, when we take a closer look at the Elderwood exploits that were being released, we're really thinking about more the set of only Internet Explorer computers, but actually only version 8, but actually only the versions that have three plugins enabled on them, Java, Office, and Flash. And really, after that, only about 50% of those, because their exploit code is so unreliable, it crashes half the time, even on platforms that it supposedly supports. So really here, these modest exploit mitigations that we have available to us would do a great deal Elderwood and the Aurora group at large haven't demonstrated a single capability to overcome things like uh, ASLR without using an array of plugins, all of which are out of date, which they depend on being out of date. Uh, so that, that was kind of interesting to me. I didn't realize that. 
when these watering hole campaigns were going on because I was too busy reading on the news and reading all these vendors and antivirus companies talk up how sophisticated these people were and how they had early access to zero-day exploit, zero-day vulnerabilities and how they had a seemingly unlimited supply of them. Nobody really looked at the exploit code to tell, like, are, are they really sophisticated? I don't know. Well, no, they're not. Their exploit code sucks. I'd like to introduce you to my class. These are, uh, this is actually a class from last night, the one that I missed, I had my TA run. Uh, these are students from, uh, these are computer science undergraduates at NYU Poly. They have no prior experience in exploitation, and every single one of them has better capabilities, has more skill in exploitation than all of the Aurora group. <laughs> uh, every year in eight weeks, we go over the Assured Exploitation Group, where we actually take Aurora's exploit code and we improve it and we make it work without those plugins. We make it work reliably. We make it work on Windows 7. We make it bypass the SLR. And all these kids, out of the entire time that I've been teaching, we get about 15 kids a semester, 14 kids a semester succeed. So I've been teaching this class for about six years. It's 270 students that know how to write exploits better than most of all of Chinese APT. This is Davis. I like Davis. Davis is the Trail of Bits intern. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is how Davis normally hangs out on campus at his university, in a suit, tie, smoking a cigar. Uh, he's a computer engineering undergrad. He completed the Assured Exploitation course in five days. He had no prior experience in exploitation. In 10 days, he came up with even better stuff. So really, when we think about kind of how effective can these mitigations be? Well, they're gonna stop a group like Elderwood and Aurora and basically everybody else that operates out there today. It's really easy to get better. So comparing the Elderwood group against what's possible for an untrained CS undergrad to understand with 40 hours of basic training plus a couple of days to get their feet wet with, uh, with a new exploit, um, it, it's, it's really tremendous how far they can come. So these exploit mitigations, they fall over when they get pushed, when they get pushed pretty easily. Uh, so to break this down here, part of the way that we test reliability, by the way, that's a, maybe I should have described this a little bit more. A lot of people think that exploits either work or they don't. It's not really true. Uh, when we tested the Elderwood exploit code, I got all the parts of it, and there are a lot of parts of it. It was actually quite hard to get all the parts to it, because they're just, it's just, not a very well-engineered piece of code. Um, all we did is I, we rigged up a system that opened a couple of websites from the Alexa Top 500, and then after it opened those websites, it sent you off to this exploit page that had the Elderwood code. And guess what? 50% of the time, it doesn't work. Uh, that's true for a lot of exploit code that gets released. Not many people test their exploits like that, because that's what a normal person would do, right? They would have a browser open, they'd be going to a couple pages, then they would come to one that had an exploit, and the DOM would be in a mess, and memory would be mapped all over the place. It wouldn't be clean at all. But the way that most people develop exploits for conferences, or for when they want to develop their own personal brand, or you know, advertise how great they are, they're not really going through that kind of testing. They don't test if it's going to work in the wild. So we perform that same kind of testing with the exploit code that my students developed, and the exploit code that Davis developed, and uh, the rates are significantly higher. The more plugins you use, the more unreliable it is. Because what if the plugin doesn't load? What if it doesn't load quick enough? Um, that kind of thing can really interfere with the reliability. However, because Davis wrote his without using any plugins, it's significantly more reliable. So yeah, this is, this is how professional exploit developers in the wild stack up against amateurs, and it's pretty sad. But, uh, you know, so on one hand, honestly, I don't understand why I don't get better, because they're really leaving a lot on the table. On the other hand, what happens if one of my students, or Davis, God forbid, defects to China, right? And he's starting to play for the other side. Um, that would be a scary thought. Uh, and now all the mitigations we have aren't really that great. However, on the other end of this, the reality is that these APT groups, they can really get what they want without dealing with dev or ASLR or sandboxes. 
if we look at kind of the major compromises that exist, things like RSA, like all our secure item tokens, uh, they used existing capabilities they had for Flash, but it wouldn't work anymore in IE because Flash runs in low integrity in, in a pseudo kind of sandbox. So you can't really get that far with it if you're doing it with the water at all, or if you're doing it with spear phishing. But, or rather, if you do it with spear phishing with an attachment, it executes locally on that system in medium integrity, and you can actually get a viable exploit that lets you install a shell on that person's computer. So that's what they did. They rapidly shifted tactics based upon changing uh, characteristics of their target. With Google, on the other hand, Google should be pretty well defended, right? Everybody there is also, uh, I wouldn't really expect them to be the biggest users of Windows in the world. Um, I, I kind of think that they probably have a few more Macs and maybe a few more Linux computers than not. But these guys, this Aurora group, they found that one guy in a remote office that used IE6 and they got him, right? So they can perform a little bit more uh, reconnaissance. They spend some more time figuring out where the weak points are and they go after that. So. All these technical defenses that we have, they don't really need anything in this context because these guys are rapidly shifting tactics to find that low cost entry point. Another way to look at this is amateurs push as hard as they can, professionals push as hard as they have to. So yeah, rapid discovery and shift to low cost attack vectors. So this is, uh, this is interesting. This means that we have to change our defensive tactics a little bit. We can't just focus on one thing. We can probably get some immediate benefits out of trying to deploy software exploit mitigations quite widely, but it really requires thinking about the problem from a little wider point of view. Now, most of these companies, they had pen tests, right? People, they hired people to try and break in, to try and find those weak points and tell them where they were, but all these companies still got hacked anyway. And it came down to it, that pen test didn't do anything for these companies. So, uh, so what does a real solution look like? Get to that in a little bit. So discoveries through this research, um, you know, just a suggestion, putting this out there. But maybe we should try and make software protections that can't be bypassed by bored CS undergrads and 40 hours of training. It's for you programming languages people out there, people doing compilers and operating system stuff, uh, that might be an avenue of research that we could take a little bit further. Just a suggestion. Um, <laughs> we also need to push harder on these professional bad guys to make them fall over. They're not gonna fall over as easily as the crime pack authors did because they care about, uh, yeah, because they can own things without caring about mitigations. They can find ways in that aren't protected by debt, that aren't protected by ASMR, that aren't protected by sandboxes. Now usually when I bring this up, people say, well, APT can always get better. And even if I implement these higher walls, then they're just going to scale them and do it. They're just going to overcome it, and that'll be the end of the story. So why try it all? Um, personally, I think it's kind of silly. Is it really prudent not to act just because you know they'll respond? You can stay ahead of them. We just need to know where they are, how fast they're going, and then we can kind of predict where they're going to be. So, taming the tiger. How do we actually look at this problem a little bit more holistically and figure out what we need to do to stay ahead of groups like APT. <clears throat> and this really brings me back to some of the original reasons that I created that Exploit Intelligence Project case study so many years ago. I was trying to introduce tactics like this kill chain thing and these courses of action to the public lexicon to help people understand that there are really straightforward methods to analyze this problem and make progress with it. So there's a variety of approaches, right? We could use this kill chain courses of action where we figure out what are the steps that an attacker has to take to break into my company? And what can I do to detect, deny, disrupt, degrade, deceive, destroy them at every single step? Or we could take the usual approach of, and this is a quote from someone that I titled Jerkface, an APT breached my network despite my $750,000 IPS and my $2 million SIEM. What other vendor product should I buy to protect myself? This is, this is kind of the typical approach, as I'm sure all you guys are aware, but I think we can be a little bit more effective than that as long as we take a really structured approach and use some of the tools that we have available already. So the first thing that you gotta do to conduct a spearfishing campaign is you gotta find a guy that wants to spearfish. 
So some research was done on this a couple years ago, and a guy that used to work at Lockheed Martin that went to go get his PhD at um, George Washington University wrote his PhD thesis on how targeted malicious emails get sent. And one of the most interesting things that he discovered is from all the employees at this company he profiled, which I'm just going to assume is Lockheed Martin, there's some guy out there, there's two guys out there that received 18 times more phishing email than everybody else in the company. Who the heck are those guys and how do I find them ahead of time? Because less than 1% of the company, of all email accounts in the company, received any targeted phishing emails at all. So if you're training all those guys, you're wasting time, first. And second off, the people further on the right hand of that graph are at significantly higher risk than everybody else. This is an area of research that I'd like to see explored. But let's move on to the next step. We got, after we figure out who we want to fish, we need to actually set up infrastructure and fish these guys. So we think about how do we resist attempts to fish? And the answer is, you know, uh, well, actually, to, to, to highlight the significant um, matter of, of this a little more, uh, Mandy released their M trends a little while back. I actually ripped this out of some article I found on the web last night. They said that 99% of the security breaches they investigated in 2012 started with a targeted spear phishing attack. 99%. I'm sure if you go look at the Verizon GBIR, they have similar statistics, probably not 99%, but it's definitely huge. Now the way that a lot of companies deal with this is they say, oh well, my users, they're just clicking on all these links, I gotta stop them from clicking on the links. So they usually hire some company, they go through months and months of repeated testing, they measure the user response rates at each step after every test, and usually the first phishing campaign that gets sent out, like 75% of people click the link. And then after months of testing, it goes down, it goes down, it goes down. Now maybe they're at like 10%. And they say, great, we make tons of progress, only 10%. That's manageable. Well, if you go from 35% to 12% on fire, you are still on fire. Just because I can only compromise 10% of your company isn't gonna stop me from gaining access to that intellectual property that I want. So when we think about phishing resistance, we need to think a little bit more about technology, a little bit less about users. And there's a lot of things that I think people are leaving on the table here. Have any of you tried to set up 1,000 mail servers at a time, covertly, with 10,000 domain names, and constantly send mail to them that has exploits attached to them? Probably not, but it's hard. And I'll tell you what, there's a lot of things that you can do from an email infrastructure point of view that might make this problem a little bit easier. So think about that a little bit. That's an area of research that I would like to see more people explore that we're completely leaving on the table right now. And then there's exploitability, right? So once I finally get access to, once I find a guy, once I sent him an email, now I have to take over his computer somehow. And we talked about this a little bit you know, earlier, just, just a tad, but uh, some ways that other people think about this, I stole this graphic from Josh Corman. Uh, he has this idea of H.P. Moore's law, which he represents as this green line, where that's the capability that Metasploit offers you, the baseline capability of a casual attacker, somebody that can point and click it on, right? You have to stay above that, or, or in front of that, and if you're not, then that means the casual attacker can own you, which is a really bad thing. What we learned here is, so Josh estimated that the uh, nation state espionage exploit capability is a little bit higher than it actually is, right? By looking at the Elderwood, uh, the Elderwood group, or the Elderwood kit, or the Elderwood exploits, we've found that actually that line probably tracks a little bit further down than people would have thought. So do you know where your systems are on this graph? And do you know how fast that's trending to the right? Can you keep up with it? And how many of your systems are in front of it? And how many of your systems are behind it? Do we have the capability to measure this within our company? Right? I don't really see a lot of great research into this either. We really just talk about what's the latest and greatest new exploit capability, or what's the, new, the latest and greatest new exploit technique. And in fact, maybe sometimes we don't, right? Because white hats don't do that research anymore. Um, so this kind of information is probably really critical for you to keep track of, but I don't really see, I, I don't really see many people thinking about how to keep track of it or where it actually is right now. 
um, which is why I enjoy so much doing research presentations like this. So kind of in conclusion here, um, if I could suggest a few things, some directions for research for all of you. Uh, first, let's make defenses that board undergrads can't take out in one semester. I think that would be obvious. Uh, let's build things that help us understand your adversary's capability and intent. It shouldn't take me doing uh, some, some research at night and on weekends to figure out what the true capabilities of the Aurora, uh, the Aurora APT group are. Right? We should have a better understanding of these things, but we don't. Because a lot of people out there in the AV industry aren't interested in giving you a sober answer to that, to that question. They're just more interested in talking, about, talking up about how sophisticated they are, how Hidden Links is going to break into every company you've ever held here. And then let's use the defenses we have, right? I, I gave that funny little example of what vendor product should I buy next, but really it's true. We have a lot of solutions available to us with default installs of operating systems, with you know, basic configuration switches, with just ingenuity, with creativity, that we leave on the table and we would rather develop some extremely expensive product to you know, oversell to people that don't need it. Or we would rather go out and look for one of those things to buy. But really what we should be doing is thinking about who are the people that want to compromise me? What are they capable of doing? And then what can I do about that? Use that courses of action uh, method. So uh, that's kind of my, my guidance, my hope for all of you guys to help me. Uh, achieve this, this kind of vision. Um, I, I'd just like to thank Andrew Roof and Hal Brodigan for helping me put together some of the data and some of the pictures. Um, they were a really big help. And if I could suggest a few resources, some places that you might want to look if you want to gain a better understanding of crime packs, of APT exploit groups, or of, uh, or of the Elderwood group or kit or wherever they are, uh, these are three places that I would consider looking up. So with that, I am done. Enjoy your day. <laughs> yes, I think we're going to Is questions appropriate, or should I just meet all you guys over the years? Any questions? Thank you for the talk. Um, from what you described to me, I think one my, my, my view of it is that it's not that we're lacking mind, it, it just it seems that, and I don't really think the industry is relying, I think it's more like a bias. Now, what, it seems to me that what we are missing is critical thinking eventually, because what you need is the process of critical thinking, looking at it, and it seems that we don't really implement it in, in our industry enough, because if we would, the solutions would have looked much better. Yeah, that's absolutely true. So, the, I, I actually, funny story, I wrote, uh, NYU Poly has a contest every year called Cybersecurity Awareness Week, which if any of you guys are students, you really should, should Google, look up, and participate in. Cybersecurity Awareness Week is a great opportunity to gain some really good experience in computer security. When I was a student, they had an essay contest, and the essay contest was about whether the security industry was a lemon market if they sold bad products, basically, as a, as a consequence of uh, like game theory. Um, and the argument that I had was that most of the industry is driven by trends. It was like, oh, do you have the latest firewall? Do you have the latest HIPS product? Do you have the latest this? Do you have the latest that? And it's really driven by competition with your peers, where they say, oh, you're missing that? Well, you're doing something bad. You really need to get it. And then everybody goes to get it. And then the next trend comes out. And that really seems to drive most of the industry, more so than the critical thinking as you described it, or uh, you know, anything that I talked about in this presentation. And I am really you know, fighting against the tide, trying to get people out of that mode of thinking, but um, it's a huge problem, and we're, we're not really going to make progress until we figure out how to do that. Oh, and that essay is Googleable if you, if you find it. I posted it to full disclosure, I think, like five years ago, so you can go back in time and see what I thought when I was uh, you know, my early 20s. Fun. Anybody, Anybody else? else? Got one up here? Now, to come back on the statistics, 
on, on the joke about the 12 percent on fire is still on fire. Oh, yeah. Yeah, nice. And uh, That's, uh, I got to give credit where it's due. Uh, Zane Lackey from Etsy Security came up with that and not take credit. Very smart guy, former co-worker of mine. But uh, his presentations are also worthy of getting a view if you have know, time. Okay. So I indeed really like that one. But how would you deal with the visual IT management or is you happy to the 80-20 rule? Like the, the problem is fixed 80%. Uh, that's good enough. Let's talk with that. So how would you get a situation where you have zero computer with Internet Explorer 6 like in Google? Or, do, or would you convince IT management to, to look for that last computer with Internet Explorer 6? Right. Well, so how would I convince them? Well, I need to provide them the capabilities so that they can do that. And we don't really have good products right now that can help people accomplish that problem. It needs to be easier for people. In terms of phishing resistance, um, you know, people will say, yes, so we made progress. We shifted it from 80 to 20. Uh, great. But at the end of the day, it did not make it any harder. It did not make it 60% harder for an APT group to accomplish their goal, right? It made it 0% harder. All I had to do was send a few more, a, a few more emails. Um, so really, if we think about what can we do to make it harder for APT groups to conduct spear phishing campaigns, I can make it 80% harder by using different kinds of technology changes to your email infrastructure to make it more difficult to receive those emails. And there's actually a, a widely researched, well understood body of knowledge around uh, spam phishing campaigns. Uh, people like PayPal really get it. And funny enough, you know, I, I've had, uh, we do plenty of work with DARPA, so we have to communicate with a lot of people in the defense industry. And funny story, uh, if you know what DKIM is, uh, Domain Keys Identified Mail, we had it misconfigured on our domain for like two months. Um, I was shifting some things around and I broke it. And we must have sent thousands of emails during that time period, but the one domain that rejected it was Raytheon. Uh, because they're significantly more attacked than anybody else that we communicate with. And they decided that it was worth their while to validate all of the emails coming in to make sure they had the right signature and weren't spoofed. Um, it helps to prevent phishing campaigns that appear to come from your suppliers and from your vendors um, affecting your employees. And they turned that on. They felt like it was worth it. And that's just one little, one little thing, one little anecdote. But there's so much more there if you go look and go explore uh, for what you can do to make phishing more difficult that does not involve wasting my user's time. So I would encourage people to explore that area. Any other questions? Thank you. Uh, you said uh, it would be useless to train people that would not receive phishing, um, but who will receive it, and who should, yeah, who should we train? Who should we train? Yeah. We should train the IT staff. You should train the IT staff to deploy secure technology. That's the people that need the training, not the users. And that's, that's really the purpose of, of everything that I'm talking about. We are not dealing with a user problem. If I can send one email to one secretary and go from that one person's computer taking over your entire company, you have a technology problem and you need to solve a technology problem. So in your opinion, awareness rating is not really useful to, to help? Absolutely not. It is the worst type of security that you can possibly implement in your company. It's a placebo and you're throwing away your money. <laughs> So I, I'm a little bit opinionated, sorry. Just, you know, kind of. Can you develop on that? It's, um, okay, I know it's, it's a bit new to say that, say that awareness raising is totally useless. But, um, Can I elaborate on it? What? You want me to talk more? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, I mean, it goes back to the, you know, if you're 50% or 10% on fire, it doesn't matter you're still on fire. If I can compromise one person within your company and take it over, then it doesn't matter how many users you trained, I'm going to find one, right? And if I, and in some cases, I don't even need to find one, right? Because this is training people against a tactic, not against a strategy. When we shift to water evolves and we put exploit code up on websites that I normally go to, what amount of training can tell me that the, uh, the newspaper that I read in the morning, the website that I go to log in to check what's going on during the day, how much training do I need to figure out when that, website posts exploit code versus when it doesn't. 
I'll never be able to know. I would have to like wire shark the thing and check packets the whole time. It's silly. So as soon as the APT group shift tactics to start moving to a different one, it invalidates all of the training. And not only that, but it's a very slow process to get people like to, to embody this, this knowledge. It takes people a year of repeated testing. And then even after that, um, the entire time you've been testing, you've been, uh, they've been responding to fake campaigns when real ones may have gone unnoticed. You are, you are making them spend time on a simulated version of this kind of test when uh, really they need to be paying attention to the other kinds of uh, emails that are coming in that actually are trying to compromise them. You are, uh, there's just too much going on. So I see a lot of companies that don't want to perform user education, that don't want to perform this kind of spear phishing training for the express reason that they like to keep their plates clean so that when that one email does come in that is actually malicious and not a test, that their users will be alert enough to pick it up. I know that sounds completely backwards from what the education people usually say, but uh, I believe it wholeheartedly, and I do everything possible to, again, train the IT staff. It is a technology problem. The people that need training are the people that deploy the technology. Okay. Um, so, what I agree with you that I think we need some better technology and you know, some defenses need to be better. Uh, and also, generally, I would say I agree that user training is kind of, let's say, a little bit overrated sometimes, maybe. I think you're, um, there are still options to, to, to do, that have to do with the users, and actually some of that is on your, was on your side as well. So, if, even after training, there are still 10% that you could compromise, so why bother with training the users? I think it makes sense to do it as long as you know which 10% those users are that could get compromised, right? And you had this on your slides, like those few people, like those 18 people, or, or I don't know how many it was, but you know, yeah. it's less than 1% people that receive those phishing emails that could fall for it potentially. As long as you have something that you can, you know, order the users based on risk, for example, yeah. you know which user are, are at risk, then you can still, you know, then you can still, it still helps you if you train a lot of users to be not in this group. I mean, yeah. so first of all that, and um, actually there has been increasingly popular to incentivize uh, detection of interesting, you know, phishing or let's say uh, strange links that come in, for example. So uh, I've, I've been told that people or companies who do this, like do incentivize their users of, of telling the IT guys, hey, there's been something weird on my system or there's been something weird in the email and so on. Then actually, even though there are phishing emails and people might fall for it, as long as you detect it, you know that it happened mm -hmm. because people tell you about it, then it's still kind of, you know, it's still okay because maybe they didn't get to the ladder or the movement yet. Sure, um, so I can address both of those points. Uh, so in terms of reconnaissance, how do we identify those people that are likely to be high on the priority list and what do we do about them once we find them? So the kinds of recommendations that I would have for once you figure out who those two guys are that receive 18 phishing emails per time period, that was studied in that, uh, in that PhD, um, is really to come up with a different control structure that helps to protect them better. So you separate your users into highly discoverable or not very easily discoverable or high value, low value. And then you can do things like uh, filter their email more effectively. Uh, we can look at their web proxy traffic on a more regular basis. Uh, we can change the kinds of software deployed on their system. But I still would not rely upon them to identify those phishing emails. Uh, because again, it's a, it's a tactical change where um, that person may be compromised through a different method that does not involve this kind of spear phishing campaign, or the reconnaissance performed against those couple of users may be so good that you can conduct a spear phishing campaign that they will not, uh, they will not notice. Um, <clears throat> so uh, really the changes that I would make again are from a technology perspective, not necessarily a training one. Yeah, I agree, but you know, in the end again, there's not, you cannot really do, like if, if I have a company now, I cannot really say, okay, I'm canceling all my user trainings, I'm getting better technologies, just not, right? It takes time to build better defenses, get, it takes time to build technologies, whatever. So I think it's still worth it. Do user training, know which kind of users are at risk, then you have less, less users to monitor, right? I mean, less users to keep an eye on and to, you know, put higher protections on. So maybe you can gradually improve. I, I agree with all that, but I, I don't agree with the, how user education actually helps that problem. I think that it's just a difficult problem to solve. You need to address it over a long period of time, and that user education is not a quick improvement, and it's it's really not really.
Um, what was the other part you mentioned? The, you got a second. Mm. Oh, I'm missing it. It was very long, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, think, I think it's pretty much covered. Okay. No. I think I, I would agree with you. There are trade offs, right? Reduce user education, definitely. But I mean, you know, to a certain extent, it could be combinations that are useful. So, what do we, wait, one more thing. Yeah. Um, what do you think about, like, um, actually, that's different, but what do you think about, you know, the workstation, host, deep monitoring stuff that has been going on with, like, the McAfee DLP, CrowdStrike, other companies that do, like, you know, try to actually not, let's say, protect you from the phishing email, oh, like, but at least <laughs> know what is going on after the phishing email, right? So, yeah. I mean, is that technology you would consider to be the next step? I am a huge fan of technologies like Carbon Black, um, and there's another sort of version coming out that's uh, like Carbon Black and Linux called Cloud Cover. Um, these kinds of systems give you a capability, they give you data, and they allow you to, uh, to mine that data to identify compromises. And it's, it's very targeted towards the data that would show up in a real compromise, and it's um, I think a very difficult kind of monitoring system to get around as an attacker. Uh, Immunity has one too, they call it El Jefe. Uh, these kinds of things I think are really where a lot of post protections need to go. Um, because if we look at kind of the shift in tactics necessary for an attacker to avoid them properly, the cost is actually quite high. Um, I don't get into that in these slides, I could probably dive deeper into the attack chain in another presentation, but um, I do think those are kind of valuable avenues to explore. Uh, although I believe there is some truth in saying that um, user education is, is probably not the best solution at this moment, but if you start to invest only in technologies to protect your users and not make your users aware, I can still, like, for example, send just a letter with a USB stick to your secretary and all your protections, despite that all of them, she will still plug it in. So, although it is... So you don't think that's a technology problem that I can plug in a USB stick? Uh, yeah, of course, cool. that's a problem, but right. even if you think <laughs> of all of the things, there will always be a flaw in your system. You can't think of all of the flaws that are in your system, or you would don't have the budget to cover all of, all of the flaws. Absolutely. So different, different types of threats, uh, human intelligence-based kinds of threats, um, those require a different response. And really what we're doing now is we're talking about spear phishing campaigns, we're talking about cyber espionage, and the things that go through a computer that deal with exploiting certain security protections and policies are not something that a user should ever be aware of. Uh, I agree with you, so if you call somebody on the phone, convince them to do something, that needs training, right? For the people that have access to that kind of information, they should be aware that somebody might try to follow and trick them. However, uh, when we start to deal with, well, what happens if somebody plugs a USB disk into a computer, that's not the user's fault, it's the guy that set up the computer's fault. And how far do you have to shield the system that it's still usable? Because it's, it's getting all, always more and more difficult to, to operate the system and use it when you shield more and more off. So it, it's yeah, it's a cost for the for the business. What we really yeah, support. of course. I mean, we're clients to one company with thirty thousand users that disables USB by, by default, and I have a very streamlined ticketing system to re-enable it in one hour periods. That's auditable and uh, they keep track of the USB ID numbers of every single device that's ever been plugged in. It's very easy to do forensics on. It's a great system, works for 30,000 people. Um, it was difficult to come up with because there are no products you can buy to do that, which is a huge gap, and which is what I'm trying to encourage people to think more about. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't think that education is the easy answer out. Uh, it's just not gonna work, and again, I just try more times, I'll succeed. Uh, the root cause of the problem is the technology. Hey, yeah. yeah Sorry, I'm, I'm really headstrong in this area. No yeah. one's going to be Yeah, maybe when you give everyone typing machines, the, the risk for exposure is quite small. Yeah. Uh, one more last question. I'm available for beers all day, so if people want to yell at me that training is worth it, I'm um, here. So you told that like undergraduate students can bake all those things. Yes. Why don't ask them to solve it? Because the benefit of being an undergrad student is having lots of time and no budget. 
So this forces you to be very creative and come up with several unique mitigations. Maybe this can be an interesting workforce to develop mitigations for the things that you discover. Oh, uh, yeah, actually, so the students of today are kind of a preview of what the attackers of tomorrow look like, right? In, in many ways. So when I look at my students, these are the kinds of people, these are the kinds of techniques and capabilities that we need to be prepared to defend against in the future. Because yes, this kinds of, uh, this, you know, well-studied and researched uh, student is uh, really somebody that I see coming down the line I will have to defend against later. Um, so my hope for training these students how to understand what attacks are being performed today is that some of them will do that research. And some of them have, right? I, I have mentored grad students, people that have gone on to publish research that have tried to help this problem. And that's why I teach them this, because if they don't understand how to pull off a real attack, what hope do they have that they'll come up with something useful to defend? Right? So that's, that's the whole focus of the course, and it makes me incredibly happy to teach it, uh, because that's what I, I want to encourage students to do research in. Um, I'm, I'm not happy letting them be ignorant of uh, how attacks really work. So I make them go through the whole process. Uh, it's rewarding for them, you know, they always give me high marks at the end, because hey, I taught them how to hack into, you know, their buddy's computer, right? Um, <laughs> we have plenty of ethics lectures that go on in this course as well. Nobody's ever made me upset. Um, but yeah, so I, I, uh, I actually, I publish a lot of my material online, and in the coming months I will be publishing more uh, from that course and from others at the university. And if other universities or other students want to get uh, acclimated to that material, uh, they can. A lot of it's on my personal website, and my hope is just that more people understand this and come up with solutions that are uh, that helpful. So, there you go. Well, I guess that's it. Uh, yeah, we're out of time, so I guess for any additional questions, they can. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thank thanks everyone for being such a great.